I've got six days to turn this beat up rusty piece of junk into something beautiful for Gas Monkey Garage's C10 pickup that's going to be at SEMA this year. Six days, the countdown begins. Good luck. If that is not a statement piece, I do not know what it is. So I need to model this grill for Gas Monkey Garage's SEMA C10 truck. With our handy scan from Creaform and Dynamic 3D, we're going to make quick work of this. Now you can see that I've already thrown targets all over this part in a random pattern. And you can see how fast this scan is coming together. And what I'm going to end up with is a nice 3D mesh that I'm able to use as a template to generate my new design and my new 3D solid model. And right now, this scanner is available in our online store at titansofcnctooling.com. All right, now that we have our scan brought into SolidWorks, we're ready to start creating our brand new design using this mesh as a template. And once our 3D design is complete, we're going to send this model over to Caracal, and Caracal is going to use their large-scale format robot arm 3D printer to create us a full-scale replica of the model that I have here on my screen. Now, the reason that we have this part 3D printed is because we want to be able to take a full-scale representation of the part over to Gas Monkey Garage to make sure that our finished part is going to fit perfectly, and that's why 3D printing is so important to our industry. All right, so now that I can see that our 3D printed part fits perfectly and our design has been validated, now I feel confident that we can load up some material, we can get this part over in the master cam, and we can start making some chips. So what we got here is 800 pounds of 6061 aluminum, 40 inches long, 18 inches wide, and six inches thick. This is out of my life because I refuse to do what Titan said and program it for the BBM. That was my idea. I came up with it yesterday. Three weeks ago, I told him to program this for the BVM. And I told him it was impossible. But you know how I roll. I do the impossible. There we go. Yes. <laughs> now the real work begins. So the first part of our process is going to be to take this huge piece of stock and set it on one, two, three blocks. And the reason that we're doing that is because I need to be able to drill all the way through our stock in all four corners. So you can see that drill tool path is going straight through our six inch thick piece of stock. Now the only other operation I want to do while this is on the blocks is take a nice qualification cut across the front of our material so that when we take it off the blocks, I'll have a face that I can indicate straight. Watch out, roadkill. Object and camera are closer than they appear. All right, now we can take this thing off the one, two, three blocks, bolt it straight to the table, and then we can get on with the next operation. Ooh. Smooth, just like my tool paths. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna drill all of our half inch holes. And the reason that I wanted to do that first is so that we still have a flat surface on the top of our stock for our drill to be able to punch through. Had I waited to do that, we would have ended up with a sloped surface on the top that our drill would just dance off the top of. Either that, or I would have had to come in and interpolate a starter hole for that drill to get into. So by doing this first, we actually ended up saving a lot of time later. Once we have our holes drilled, we come in with our one inch end mill and we start doing some OptiRough tool path. Now we have a lot of material to remove on this piece of stock. And the way that I have our part oriented in here is with everything kind of shifted up as high as I could get it. So we're continuing to rough our part now with that same tool. And you can see what we did is we started with our cutter fully engaged so the flutes were completely buried in material. Then we step up a hundred thousandths at a time, which is slowly starting to create the actual cosmetic geometry of our finished part. So once we had everything roughed out with the one inch end mill, we come back in with a half inch ball end mill that's gonna get all these cusps out that I don't want there for our semi-finishing processes. So you see here, a lot of the things that our one inch end mill just couldn't get to, the half inch ball is able to helix in and then open up the pockets. And this is a typical roughing process that people will use in a lot of different types of parts. You start with a big monster cutter and then slowly work your way down the smaller tools so that you can get some of the finer features. Now you can see one of the things that I did next is came down into our headlight holes. And I wanted to take a little bit of this material out because when our half inch ball comes in to actually start semi-finishing these surfaces, I didn't want it plunging into a big heavy cut because that could cause cutter deflection and end up 
pushing our cutter actually into our finished surface. So for all of our semi finishing, I'm leaving five thousandths of stock. So we don't want any expected material because that could cause gouging. Now that our semi finishing is all done, we've gotten into our actual finishing. Now something that I wanna point out is that for all of our finishing tool paths, we are only using climb cut to finish every one of these surfaces. Through one climb cut, retract, pull out, go back into another climb cut. What that's gonna result in is a much higher quality finished surface. I need to know something right now. Which one of y'all broke into our shop last night and changed all of Barry's feeds and speeds, <laughs> his tool he was using? You pretty much come in here and changed his whole setup. And I know that because that is the most beautiful part I've ever seen <laughs> from a machine that Barry was running. And there is no way that he's the one that ran this. I think you mean it's the most beautiful part you've seen in your life. It's pretty good for an amateur, I will say that. <laughs> There is nothing home. anybody could tell me that will convince me that Barry's the one that made this part. <laughs> now, when we go to flip this thing over, we're gonna take a couple of safety precautions. Number one, we're gonna use a combination of brute strength and our forklift. The only reason Jesse wouldn't like this is because he can see his own reflection in it. <laughs> <laughs> I could practically see my future in this thing. It does not look good. <laughs> We're gonna protect our finished surfaces with a nice piece of foam. We're gonna flip it onto a piece of plywood. Then we're gonna use our straps to gently lift the part. All right, hold there. Go ahead, come down slow. There's a lot of things in this world that I thought I would never see. Barry making a beautiful finish is one of them. Barry did this and he, isn't in, he hasn't even went through our academy. Imagine what he could do if he did. Now for this back side, we have a lot of material to remove. We're going to make a lot of chips. And you can see pretty much the only feature that we needed this stock to be that thick for is this mounting bracket that's starting to take shape right now. tired and I want this to be over. All right, so now that we have the majority of our roughing done, there's only two parts that are critical to this process that we're gonna focus on. Number one is cutting down our tabs, and number two is the mating surface where the two halves of the grill are gonna come together. Now, if you guys notice, we have this really cool center section with our logo on it, and Jesse's machining that over on our DBF 5000, so be on the lookout for that video coming soon. All right, our op two is complete on our first half of our Gas Monkey Garage grill. Now that we're there, that just means we have to do it all over again for the other half. And I'm tired and it's Sunday and I wanna go home and rest. But there's no rest for the machinist, so let's go make some more chips. So we're all done with op one on our second part. So now all we gotta do is bust our bolts loose, get this thing out, flip it over, and bring it back in and finish the second side. Boom. So hurry up, Ben.
is it, man. I hope you like it. Oh, what man. are you talking about? You guys are titans <laughs> of CNC. Why would I not like it? I don't even know what's above a titan. And CNC machining, nothing. Yeah, there <laughs> you go. Rip it out, man. All right, let's do it. Take <laughs> Holy <laughs> If that is not a statement piece, I do not know what it is. This will probably be the most photographed uh, grill in the history of SEMA. I sure hope in the, so. In the history of <laughs> GMC C10s. Wow. I will say that uh, this will scratch real easy. Okay. So be gentle with my baby. Okay. <laughs> that is cool. I love it that your logo's right there. Freaking wicked. God. I wonder how many of these I could sell at thirty thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> you got the price about right there, buddy. <laughs> it, yeah, that, I, that's what I was telling uh, Daphne when you were driving up. I was like, "Well, here comes about a thirty thousand dollar grill." <laughs> so there you go, all you naysayers, gas monkey. What? <laughs>